Navigator Pilot Program. We provide no cost consulting to entrepreneurs and small businesses in Jefferson, Franklin, Washington, St. Francis, and St. Genevieve counties in Missouri. We also connect these clients with resources or spokes to assist them with other services such as accounting, legal, marketing, and funding through loan application assistance. As a disclaimer, the purpose of this presentation is to provide general information only. It is not intended to be a comprehensive summary of any ordinances, regulations, and or laws. The information presented does not constitute legal advice. One should always contact their attorney, CPA, and or any other professional or authoritative agency with any questions or concerns. So, why is cybersecurity important? Businesses need cybersecurity awareness and a strategy to protect themselves, their customers, and all data they store from cyber threats. A few things that we'll go over today are threats, good internet browsing practices, avoiding suspicious downloads, authentication tools, keeping your data safe, and is your credit at risk? Is your personal credit at risk? So, a few common threats. Malware, viruses, ransomware, spyware, and phishing. So malware is an un umbrella term that refers to software intentionally designed to cause damage to a computer, server, or a computer network. Malware can include viruses and ransomware. So that brings up viruses. These are harmful programs intended to spread from computers to other connected devices like a disease. Cyber criminals use viruses to gain access to your systems and to cause significant and sometimes unrepairable issues. Ransomware. This is a specific type of malware that infects and restricts access to a computer until some sort of ransom is provided. Just like being kidnapped, they want ransom. Ransomware will commonly encrypt data on the victim's device and demand money in return for a promise to restore the data. Ransomware exploits unpatched vulnerabilities in software and is usually delivered through phishing emails, which we will get to. Spyware is a form of malware that is designed to gather information from a target and then send it to another entity without consent, you know, just like James Bond. There are several types of spyware that are legitimate, legal, and operate for commercial purposes such as advertising data collected by social media platforms. However, malicious spyware is used frequently to steal information and send it to other parties. Phishing. This is a type of cyber attack that uses an email or a malicious website to infect your computer or system with malware or to collect sensitive information. Phishing emails appear as though they've been sent from a legitimate organization or a known individual. These emails often entice users to click on a link or open an attachment containing malicious code. Be very cautious about opening links from unknown sources. If something seems suspicious from a known source, don't just click on it. Ask the source directly if it's legitimate. So for instance, Michael and I work in the same office, um, in the same building. Uh, we do have separate offices. But if I get an email from Michael and it seems a little bit out of character for him, or there might be some typos, or he's telling me, hey, check out this great deal on the Chevy Trailblazer that I found, click here. Like that's not a normal conversation or a normal email that Michael and I would have. Well, it might be a normal conversation, but it wouldn't be an email that he would send me. That would be like, you know, water cooler talk, right? So instead of clicking or even replying, I'm either gonna get up and go ask Michael if he sent me that, or I'm gonna give him a call and ask him if he sent me that. I don't wanna reply, I don't wanna take action, I don't wanna click on anything. I wanna figure out what's going on first. So here's an email, a phishing email example. I'm gonna give you a moment to go ahead and review this email. And then this is kind of an interactive portion. So anyone who would like to take part in this, you are more than welcome to. Um, look over this email and in the chat, if you're able, or you're more than welcome to come off of mute, um, see if you can 
um, identify or or um, put in, like I said, put in the chat or speak about some of the red flags that you see in this email. Um, give it about a minute and then I'll let you guys um, know when you can come off mute. That way everybody has a good uh, chance to review this email. All right, so now is the time. Go ahead and either put a chat in or, like I said, take yourself off mute. If you want to interact, that is absolutely fine. But if you can just give me uh, a red flag that you saw or even a couple red flags that you saw. Looks like we've got a couple in the chat that are typing a few things out. Super choppy grammar, yes, Tamika. Uh, yeah, George, a strange attachment, absolutely. The sender email, thank you, Brittany. Sent from a Gmail account, absolutely. Phone number, yep. Typos, grammar, fear-based urgency, yes, and And I'll let Josh put his comment in there and then I'll bring everything up. There's no February 30th. Yes. <laughs> All right. Absolutely, you guys. So the sender email address. So as you pointed out, this is from Gmail. So if it's, if this were actually coming from AT&T, it would be coming, you know, and I'm not really sure if it's att.com or att.net. I actually haven't paid attention to that. That's horrible. Um, but it would be coming from, you know, maybe msmith at att.net. Um, and it's not. Anyone can go on Gmail and create a Gmail account claiming to be any business, claiming to be anybody. I could go on there right now and create a, a Gmail address and say, um, you know, and gig 2023 at gmail.com and start emailing people as Anne. So, um, you know, it has very lax um, security to create that, that email account. Um, so urgency, the subject is urgent. What happens whenever you get anything, whether it's in your business, biz, the business, business or personal life. If you receive anything that says delinquent, your immediate reaction is, oh my gosh, I got to figure out what's going on here. I have to get this taken care of because we don't want accounts closed. We don't want negative marks on our credit report. You know, delinquent says it is bad. That is a negative statement. And we want to get that fixed. You know, you think, oh my gosh, this must just be, this must be an accident. I have to get this fixed immediately. Uh, the attachment name. So it doesn't say, you know, um, Jane Doe February invoice. It's it's a random selection of characters and numbers and letters. It's, it just doesn't look right at all. Um, this also does not address Jane by name. This says dear customer. So that tells you right there that that is something that can be used over and over and over again, and it never has to be changed because there is nothing in here that says, dear Jane, we are contacting you about your company, ABC, ABC company. It doesn't name any kind of personalization here. The only kind of personalization here is the fact that it was sent to her email because she was probably in a bulk email. 
Uh, this lacks proper vernacular, so absolutely super spotty um, grammar. The spelling is off, all kinds of things. Uh, misspelled words. This is asking you to click a link. So it's got that pay now link, right? So if you click that, Lord only knows what it's gonna, where it's going to take you or what can come through the other end of that link into your computer. Uh, this is asking you to send a payment information. So it is asking you, if you don't want to click the link, uh, just go ahead and reply with your payment information. Don't ever send that payment information. Please, please, please don't ever do that. Uh, and then this is threatening. It's threatening collection and account closure, which again, like we were talking about with the subject, whenever you see delinquent, um, collections, account closure, those are all negative things. Those are all going to be um, negative marks on your business, negative marks on your personal um, accounts and personal credit, and you don't want that, so you want to get this fixed. And then again, the phone number, this is invalid. Um, so as you know, anybody who watches movies, whenever you are watching a movie, every single phone number on a movie is 555 something. Um, but even if they put a legitimate working phone number in here, if you dial it, uh, it's not going to be Mary Smith at AT&T Company. Um, it, it may not even be a working number, or it may go to um, Jim Bob at uh, Joe's Russell, Joe's Steakhouse in Texas. You don't know. Um, so just always, you know, contact your actual AT&T um, personnel. You know, go to the nearest store, um, look at your own statements, log into your account through your app or on your, on the website, however you do it, log into your own. Don't reply to this, don't open anything, don't click on a link, don't do anything. So you want to have a response plan. So in this plan, you want to identify which endpoints have been impacted by the attack, you want to communicate. So once the impact of the attack and the point of entry have been identified, communicate your findings to necessary parties as soon as possible. Block, if possible, block any further access from the origin of the malware, such as originating website, email, or IP address. address excuse me. Restore, put affected data in a known good state where there is no chance of malware remaining. This can be done with re-imaging, rebuilding, or a combination of the two. So this one goes, and we will discuss this, about backing up. Your company needs to have a good backup routine in place. If every Friday you are backing up your systems, whether it's to an off-site server or a flash drive or the cloud, you need to establish that backup routine. Because if I received that email, that phishing email, if I received that today, and by some chance I clicked on something, opened something, replied, did something, and it allowed something to enter into our system, I know that on Friday, that our system was good and secure, and this happened today on Wednesday. So we're gonna restore that back to last Friday. Recover. Recover as much affected data as you can using available backups. There you go. This is particularly applicable to ransomware attacks. And then you wanna re-examine. Sit back and take a hard look at your current security strategy and what allowed the malware to get through in the first place. By analyzing and sealing these gaps, you protect your organization from a similar attack in the future. So with that, that would be my fault. So if I received that email and I clicked on something or I opened something or I replied, that is on me. So that means that I need to have better training to be able to identify phishing emails and how to respond to phishing emails, which is not acting on them, not doing anything except for immediately notifying my IT, um, my IT team, excuse me, my IT team and my director and possibly even my coworkers, you know, hey, this is what's going on, um, you know, just, just to let you know. So that's something that you need to figure out. Um, do you need more training? Would at the, I at that point obviously would need more training if I did something on that kind of an email. So with all of these wares, you want to be aware. So let's talk about some of the other wares out there. 
So shareware, users have a chance, it, with this, users have a chance to try a limited version of a new software for free. Developers can have consumers test their products. This, is, this type of wear is popular with gamers. They're able to try a portion of a new game before purchasing the full version. And the users are encouraged to share the limited version of the software to promote larger distribution and sales. This brings us to freeware. Kind of similar, kind of not. This is copyrighted software and it's available at no cost for unlimited use. The developers retain all rights to the program and controls the distribution. So the users typically aren't able to share this. And the users can sometimes purchase additional services or options like upgrading to a better package. And then we have adware. So this strikes home for a lot of people, especially if you have Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, any kind of um, shopping app, just anything, because we've all had that moment where you and somebody else have been discussing something like, I don't know, um, a, a new tape dispenser, for instance, and then you open your Facebook and then all of a sudden you have um, all these ads for a new tape dispenser. Or um, for instance, I'm an iPhone user. I go on my Safari or I go on my Amazon and I look for new tape dispensers and then I get onto Facebook and there is ads for a tape dispenser. So these are advertisement materials, uh, displays or downloads, uh, advertisement material displays or downloads while the program is running. This allows the developer to potentially make money from ads within the program. And this is most often distributed between via freeware, but can still be in shareware. And these can track your online behaviors and display personalized ads. So let's talk about some good internet browsing practices. You want to avoid visiting sites that lack an SSL certificate. URLs of SSL enabled sites typically begin with HTTPS rather than HTTP. And you will see the padlock at the beginning. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to see the little snip I have in here. This is a screenshot of, our, of my browser um, bar. And this is just on our website, jfcac.org. If you look over, you'll see the HTTPS for secure, and then you've got that padlock. You want to pay attention to the websites you visit or are routed to. Visit legitimate and trusted websites for safe and secure browsing. You want to regularly check trusted websites for its latest safety information. Make purchases from secure sites. And as far as purchases go, I know everybody has different feelings about sharing their um, payment information, and that's the same for business or personal. Um, I know I am a big fan of PayPal. Um, I've been a, a user of PayPal for probably, I don't know, 15 years now, maybe. Um, maybe a little bit less, but not, not very many less. Um, I've never had any issues with PayPal, any kind of um, disputes I've had have been handled very well, and there aren't many sites that don't take PayPal. So, um, you know, I have a friend and they actually use Venmo. They just started their business. It's like a little farm and mercantile store. Um, they're, they're doing great, but they didn't have a credit card machine set up. They don't use PayPal, so they were using Cash App and Venmo. Uh, unfortunately, something happened to where they were transferring um, more than $1,000 from their Venmo account to their bank account, and somehow the uh, amount of money left Venmo but did not reach their bank account, and now their bank is saying call Venmo. Venmo is saying call their bank. So they're kind of getting the runaround because, um, not saying Venmo is bad in any way, but 
I personally have had better experiences with PayPal. Um, they're they're a little bit more easy to deal with. Uh, Venmo, that my friend is having a really hard time with actually getting a person to speak with and trying to get this result has kind of been a nightmare for them. Um, so uh, again, just a lot of sites where you would pay for things, where you would purchase things online, they do take PayPal and it is a very secure way. That way you're not sharing your payment information directly with the um, site that you're buying from. So um, you wanna make sure you keep your browser that you use updated. Be careful when clicking on hyperlinks and ads. Use a secure internet connection. Do not use public Wi-Fi. If you're doing anything that um, has to do with personal data, personal or business data, block your pop-ups and clean your web browser cookies and cache. Cache, cache. I say it cache, sorry if it is cache. <laughs> um, all right, so avoiding suspicious downloads. If online, check if the source site is the legitimate official source. Hackers will register websites using the official name with a different TLD, which is going to be, you know, .com, .net, .org, .gov, .edu, on and on. So, for instance, we have ours, again, jfcac.org. That is our official website. Um, a fake could be jfcac.tech. You want to check, check the file for the proper extension. Uh, an image most commonly is either a JPEG or a PNG. Uh, a form is going to be a docx, a PDF, or an RTF. Most of the time, um, .exe is going to be a dangerous file, so you want to avoid those. And also from unknown, unknown sources like .rars and .zips. Do not open or download any attachments from unknown or suspicious looking email senders. Again, going back to that phishing email example. And keep your antivirus turned on as a last line of defense. Don't let it just automatically have to do all the work for you. You've got to be paying attention to what you're doing as well. So authentication tools. You want to enable multi-factor authentication. Cell phones have the option to enable facial and or thumbprint recognition in addition to a passcode to unlock the phone or use login information stored on the phone for various accounts or apps. Set your accounts to notify you when a login attempt has been made and set your accounts to require a verification via text or phone call when a login attempt has been made. You wanna make sure that you're also using strong passwords. Do not use the same password on multiple accounts. Do not use easily guessed passwords. And use passwords containing letters, numbers, and characters to form a random word, such as pineapple dog 75. When you look at that random word, you have everything that most sites require. You have an uppercase. You have a special character for the exclamation point for the I in pineapple. You have a number for the E instead of the E, you have another uppercase, and then you have two more numbers. So whenever you are using the same password, if I used the same password like Kelly123, and I've never used that password, but I like to use it as an, an example. Um, if I use Kelly123 on my AT&T account, as well as my bank account, as well as my Amazon account, as well as my PayPal account, if anybody can get into one account with that password, they are going to try to get into other accounts with that same password. So if you're using the same password on multiple accounts, you are a very easy um, victim. You can be a very easy victim of someone getting into all of your accounts. Um, easily guessed passwords. Again, my name and one, two, three. That's not very hard. Um, same thing with my kiddos though. Um, I rarely use my daughter's name for passwords. Um, I know a lot of people like to use their kid's name and then birth date or the year that they were born. Um, that's, that's pretty easily guessed. If anybody knows anything about you, which it's not hard to guess also in the age of social media, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so you just wanna be sure that you're using different passwords and you make it a little harder to guess. <laughs> um, 
Also, some smartphones give the option of a strong password containing a random sequence of letters, numbers, and characters. Again, I am an iPhone user, so whenever I create a new account on something or I'm changing a password or updating a password, it gives me the option of them self-generating a password, which is, you know, uh, X, three, B, one, seven, exclamation point. Like it's something I could never remember, um, but that could also be a thing. Uh, that you may want to try. With that, though, I would have to make sure that that password is saved to my phone because I would constantly be having to reset it. Which brings us to, again, on iPhones, if you go to access your passwords, uh, like if you go into settings and then you have your stored passwords in there, it again does your facial recognition or it requires your passcode for your phone to be able to get into those passwords. So that's just another le level of security. You have to get into your phone and then get into your password to use that and to see anything. So let's talk about keeping data safe. Secure payment processing. Work with your banks or card processors to ensure you are using the most trusted and validated tools and anti-fraud services. You may also have additional security obligations related to agreements with your bank or payment processor. Isolate payment systems from less secure programs and do not use the same computer to process payments and casually browse the internet. Control physical access. Prevent access or the use of business computers by unauthorized individuals. So we aren't going to allow, like Michael and I and Brittany and Marquita, we are not going to allow a client to come in and openly use our computers. We have, um, you know, secure client data on there. We have agency data on there. We have um, our own emails on there, things like that. So if you are something that you're servicing clients that they may need a computer for, maybe see if it's in the budget to get a laptop to set up for clients to use. Um, so that's also another point that you can think of. Um, let Excuse me. Laptops and mobile devices can be particularly easy targets for theft and can be lost, so lock them up when unattended. Make sure a separate user account is created for each employee and require strong passwords. Administrative privileges should only be given to trusted IT staff and key personnel. Conduct access audits on, all, on a regular basis to ensure that former employees have been removed from your systems and have returned all company issued devices. So this kind of goes, we're going to skip over to backup for right now, and then we're going to go to control data access. So you want to frequently audit the data and information you are housing in cloud storage repositories such as Dropbox, Google Drive, Box, and Microsoft services. Appoint administrators for cloud service drive, cloud storage drive, and collaboration tools, and instruct them to monitor user permissions, giving employees access to only the information they need. So the control physical access and control data access definitely go together. Because if you have an accounting, an accountant at your business, but you also have a safety manager, those two people are likely not going to need access to the same data to the same computer even maybe. So you wanna make sure that your safety manager can't access your QuickBooks, but your accountant also can't access your safety manager's files. So those are two things that you just need to think about when setting up those user accounts. So again, back up your data. Regularly back up data on all of your computers. Forms of critical data include word processing documents, electronic spreadsheets, databases, financial files, human resources files, and accounting files. If possible, institute data backups to cloud storage on a weekly basis. Again, we talked about that earlier. If you are doing your routine data backups and you're doing them every Friday, if something happens that following Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know that you have a safe point to restore your systems to. So, assess your business's risk. Having a cybersecurity plan is becoming a common requirement, almost as much so as a business plan. Because truly, what business in existence right now can you think of that would not use any kind of technology? Um, 
you know, even uh, even Tamika with her baking, um, how is she going to receive those orders? She's going to receive them via Facebook, via a website, via email. So there's not a lot out there. There's not a lot of companies out there that don't have something to do with some kind of technology. So a lot of places are looking at how are you going to protect yourself and your customers whenever there is a cyber attack, if ever there's a cyber attack. So it's a good practice to have either a dedicated IT employee or a contracted IT consultant or company to monitor your business's systems and to be a point of contact if there is suspicious activity. You can visit the SBA website for val valuable resources. And Brittany did share that in the chat for you all. There, you can take advantage of their various cybersecurity tools and resources like the cybersecurity planning tool that helps you create a custom cybersecurity plan based on your business's needs. So how can your credit be at risk? And this is for your personal credit too. Websites ask probing questions under the guise of security. These questions may seem routine and generalized at first, but may progress into more personal identifying data. So let's go through a few of these possible questions that you'll encounter. Create a username and password. Again, if you use the same password for multiple accounts, this is an easy way to be hacked. So your username, a lot of times that can be a telephone number or an email address. Sometimes though, they don't allow email addresses and you'll have to do something different like kmiller123. Um, so then it's going to ask for your email address. Okay, so this way you can get confirmation and verify your email address. If you sign up for a newsletter, if they're gonna send you some kind of um, coupon code for signing up, just anything. Phone number, mm, what do you need that for? Okay, well, depending on what it is, you know, maybe I'm signing up for a new credit card or something. Uh, they may need a phone number to be able to reach me about my account. Um, okay, I guess, yeah. Uh, mailing address, well, what do you need that for? Well, again, if I'm signing up for something, they may wanna mail me something, so uh, I guess, okay. So let's talk about mother's maiden name, father's middle name, favorite pet, high school mascot. These are common security questions because these are things that typically don't change. Your mother's maiden name isn't going to change. Your father's middle name isn't going to change. Your favorite pet probably isn't gonna change unless you continue to get pets, but there's always gonna be that one pet that's always gonna be your favorite, at least I have that. Um, high school mascot. If you are graduated and there's no chance of you transferring to any other high school, your high school mascot isn't gonna stay the same. And these are common security questions across different platforms. So whenever you go to sign up for something, what typically happens? You choose your own security questions to be asked. And you're gonna go with ones that you remember because a favorite movie, that could change. Um, new movies come out every day. You watch different movies every day. So that's something that could change. I know my favorite movie when I was 20 isn't my favorite movie right now at my age. So that's something that's gonna change, something that I'm not gonna remember. So typically we choose security questions that we are going to remember. And the things that we remember are things that aren't going to change. So next, date of birth. Hmm, what does something need my date of birth for? If I'm not applying for something that has anything to do with my personal information, what do they need my date of birth for? Uh, maybe they're going to send me some birthday coupons or something. Okay. Or maybe I'm getting onto an alcoholic site. Um, like, for instance, if you go on to Anheuser-Busch, I believe, it asks you if you're 18 or if you're 21 or older, or it asks you to input your date of birth um, because it has to do with alcohol. They want to make sure you're 21 years of age or older. So, mm, okay, maybe I'll go ahead and do that. Last four to six digits of your social security number, if not the full one. So again, foregoing any kind of application for money, credit, anything like that, what are they needing that for? Are they saying that they need that for verification of some type? 
what would that be if I'm not getting anything, if I'm not getting money, if I'm not getting creating anything that has to do with a medical medical account? Like what, what in the world would they need that for? Providing this personal data exposes individuals and their businesses to the risk of identity theft and other crimes. So this brings us to the wonderful world of social media. As with any site on the internet, you must be cautious when providing information about yourself. Take this time to think about what is available on your social media page right now. If I not being friends with you on social media or not being connected with you on any way, shape or form, if I were to go on your Facebook page, what public details would I be able to see? I personally have my own Facebook page set to private. The only thing that you can see if you are not my friend is my profile picture and my cover picture and my name. You can't see things that I post unless I choose to make those posts public. You can't see where I live, where I'm from, what high school I went to, my relatives, my likes. You can't see any of that. So think about what is publicly available to non-friends, non-connections, non-followers. Answering questions on social media pages that ask for your first concert you attended, your favorite vacation spots, favorite movies, books, etc. Those can be probing questions as well. How many times do you see your friends or how many times do you even share that meme that says, tell me what your first concert was, tell me what your favorite book is. So those can be used to try to guess passwords because sometimes those are security questions. You know, tell me what your first vehicle was. Tell me where you went to high school. Um, we have the running joke here in Missouri that that is the first question that gets asked when you meet a new person. Hi there, Michael, my name's Kelly. And Michael turns around and goes, oh, hi, Kelly, where are you from? What high school did you go to? Um, don't know what it is. Don't know if you guys have that same experience in Montana or New Jersey, but that is a big thing here in Missouri. What high school did you go to? Um, so if people do not have their uh, like family trees set to private on family tree sites like Ancestry, um, people can easily access that information that would give away the first and middle and maiden names of other relatives. So mother's maiden name is right there. Father's middle name is right there. So think about the different things that can be found about you right now out there on social media sites, family tree sites, anything. So going back to checking your credit, as an individual and a business owner, it is important that you know what is being reported on your credit. Frequently check the accuracy of your credit reports. Sign up to use a trusted and verified credit management or monitoring service such as Experian, Credit Karma, NerdWallet, or Credit Sesame. Please note, the SBRC has no affiliation with the above. They are provided as examples only and not to be construed as promotion of services or subscriptions. And you can also request a free copy of your credit report from the credit bureaus once per year. So you can contact each of the three credit bureaus and they will send you a copy of your credit report for free one time per year. If there's anything on your credit report that does not belong to you, such as credit or loan accounts, late payments, inquiries, or collections, take immediate action. Contact the credit bureaus reporting the account and dispute the account. Contact the creditor reporting the account and contact the authorities if you feel your identity has been stolen. All right. Questions, anyone? Questions, comments, suggestions, concerns, for that matter of fact. All right, well, you guys are still have a chance for any questions, but I would like to let you guys know about some trainings that we do have coming soon. So the SBRC is excited to tell you about our upcoming trainings. As I mentioned earlier, we are still trying to convince people that there is no catch and we are not a scam. So something we actually haven't done, which kind of seems so obvious now, um, is we are going to have a webinar that is literally explaining what the SBRC is and how we help small businesses. And we're going into detail about 
how we got our funding, um, how our spokes operate, who our spokes are, how they can help you, and what we do and do not cover. And then uh, next month in July, uh, we have we are going to have a um, webinar on business loans and which one is right for your small business. So we know that there are many business loans out there. So we want to help you figure out how they differ and which one might be better for your business as well as you personally. And then other than that, if we don't have any trainings on our um, official again, when I say Facebook, official YouTube channel. Again, those previous trainings are going to be on there and today's session will be on there as well. Um, if they're not on there, let us know what trainings you would like to see. All right, and we got some chats here. So uh, Tamika, it may not be class related, but oh, what is your YouTube channel? I'd like to watch previous lessons. Yep, that's right there in the chat for you. Oh, I see that on the slide, thank you. Yep, so you can, Brittany, put the link into our official channel, or if you just go to YouTube and in the YouTube search bar, you can type in at JFCAC underscore SBRC, and then you will arrive at our official YouTube channel. Well, if we do not have any other questions, comments, concerns, anything, I will say thank you all so much for attending today's cybersecurity training. We appreciate each one of you. I hope that it was informative and I didn't bore you all too much. And again, if you have any kind of questions or suggestions, I am absolutely open to that. Um, cybersecurity is not my niche market. I did what I could with researching and built this off of that. So I'm always open to any kind of criticism. I promise I won't be upset. Uh, and thank you so much for attending. Josh, thank you as well. All right. Well, thank you all so much and have a glorious day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy thank your you week. Guys.